Welcome back to Mark Hollibus of Vlog, everyone. Thanks for joining in on this beautiful, if not slightly snowy kind of a day. Today, we're going to go for a drive. Obviously, we've got the F-Type here. It's running. It's ready to rock and roll. But I can't help but notice there's lots of conversation on the forums. Constantly, people are wondering two major things. What are these things like in the winter, which we'll speak about on another day because I already talked about that a little bit last year. We'll get into that. But another thing is... How reliable are the F-Types, and even more specifically the R, but how reliable are these things a pain in the butt to own? In general, I would say no. They're, they're reasonable for a luxury car, a premium, sporty, high output luxury car. A Toyota Corolla, they're not. But that's okay. That's actually a good thing. So let's talk about some of the issues that you can expect or some of the things that I've heard in the forums, and I'll kind of summarize if I think it's worth the time and effort to buy a car like this that has a moderate level of reliability. So the other thing I have to point out, of course, if you know my other channel is Exotic Car Play Place, then you'll know I talk a lot about what the practical side of owning cars is. You know, reliability, depreciation, what it's like to own, but ultimately my message is life's too short to drive boring cars. Why? Because we all have to find that right balance. Yeah, it is too, life's too short to drive boring cars, but at the same token, Everybody cares to some degree about reliability. The real, the real question is to where is that balance? Where can you find that sweet spot where those vehicles, yeah, I can tolerate a few problems or you've crossed over the line and now you're driving a car that's just absolutely intolerable. Right here, we'll show you my E60 M5. You're all aware that I have this car that has the glorious V10 in this M5. Absolutely magnificent car. I've always loved this car ever since I saw it on Top Gear and Jeremy Clarkson driving this car talking about hitting the M button and you get that screaming roar Lamborghini style sound coming out from under the hood while really it's exhaust sound that you're hearing from these cars but the reliability is not their game I mean you've got soft differential it is electronic and they tend to fail you've got a V10 engine that's high revving but unfortunately the rod bearings are a common factor they are known to go anywhere from 60 to 80,000 miles with the rod bearings. Throttle actuators, I've actually had a couple go on mine. Fortunately, it was under warranty, so these are already used to have some miles, and they're in the middle of the engine. You've got to pull, pull the intake, plant them off, and it's quite extensive, and it's quite expensive. These cars are not the epitome of reliability. As a matter of fact, most would argue that this is probably the most unreliable car BMW has ever made. Then we've got an X5 diesel. Well, that engine's really bulletproof, but it is an X5, so a lot of other things go. For example, the air ride suspension. Constantly an issue with these vehicles. Heater fans, we've done two of them already. Turbos, EGR valves. Lots of different issues with these vehicles. We won't even talk about the diesel exhaust fluid and the heater that's gone twice on this vehicle as well. Then we've got a Mercedes. Well, let's not talk about reliability, but they're not as bad as a lot of people think. And then you've got a vehicle like this. It's a Honda. But you've got to drive that vehicle, that's the problem. So you go full scale reliability, but then you've got to drive something that looks like that. How about a pickup truck? Well, it's a Dodge, so transmissions, electrics, they're not perfect either, you get problems there. So what is the issue in driving these? Well, really I would say they actually have a relatively moderate level of reliability, but we'll talk about a few of those things. Let's go for a quick drive and get into it. reliability and what it really means to each and every one of you and again as I mentioned on my other channel you know life is too short to drive boring cars so everyone can get into a Toyota Corolla right I mean everybody can drive a Honda Accord and those are all great vehicles if your primary objective is nothing more or nothing less than getting to A and B reliably with as little cost and expense as possible great cars absolutely I will never take away from that and I always do promote those so if Somebody's asking me, say a family member's asking me, a great car to drive, what would I recommend? Well, I know the individuals. So if, if, if it's, to say, my kids, for example, and I'm going to say, you need to drive something reliable because you're a student, for example. You're young. Maybe you don't have a lot of money to throw away. I'm going to suggest that they go to a Honda Civic or a Toyota Corolla, maybe an Accord. Cars like that that are absolutely rock solid, bulletproof, and they're never going to let anybody down or rarely anyway, and if they do, they're gonna be very cheap to fix. That's the far one end of the spectrum. For me, you know, I've been around a little bit now, and now, you know, I love reliability. If I could honestly say I could get in this car and not have one issue in five years or 10 years of ownership, that's a huge win. But I have to expect that there will be some little things along the way, and I think we all kinda of have to assume that. 
If you're buying a Jaguar, you got to expect that you're not going to have Toyota Corolla reliability. You've got to expect it. I expect it. The real question is how much of that unreliability can you tolerate? And that's why, again, I keep talking about life's too short to drive boring cars because it is, it really is. And if you're a car person, I would say drive the car that you enjoy driving. If it's a BMW M4, if it's a Jaguar F-Type or a Porsche 911, maybe it's a Corvette C8, whatever that is, why restrict yourself? Why limit yourself to, you know, people that tell you, no, nah, it's, you know, that's for the younger people or no, you're too old or too mature for that. That's not the right choice or that's not the responsible choice. I say nonsense. That's ridiculous. Drive the car that makes you happy. But I'll, I'll be honest. So dialing this back, you'll know the place, you'll know the time and you'll know the vehicle that's going to cause you troubles and the vehicle when you've crossed that line where reliability has been compromised just too much. I had a BMW 335 before this and as I've said you guys all know that I have the M5 and you know that they're not the most reliable car but to me that's a bit of a keeper and I believe there's some value in that car for the long term. So I don't see me getting rid of the M5 anytime soon. Now the 335 I had was that twin turbo in line six. It was the N54 and you know, I've talked about that one before. That car was a piece of junk. Now, if you're a tuner and that's your sole objective, it's a great platform to start with. But I'm going to be honest with you. It was not a great car. I personally felt that working on it, fixing something, correcting a leak, tuning this, ch chasing a problem down, rectifying an issue, or fixing, you know, some kind of leak or problem or, or boost problem or turbos or wastegate rattle, I, you know, it got to a point where it was just way more than I wanted to, you know, sign up for, to be honest. I don't mind fixing stuff. I don't mind, you know, understanding that there will be issues. And I went into it knowing that. I didn't realize that I would literally be fixing and changing parts every single week. That car only had 60,000 miles on it. And while the base engine was fine, I mean, it didn't burn oil or any of that. There was leaks, 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 and more leaks. All I did was fix leaks on it. And then of course you have turbo boost leaks and vacuum leaks because O-rings and rubber gaskets and the in intake manifold and you had coolant related problems everywhere, water pumps, thermostats. I mean, I had the waste get rattle coming on. I know my car had a high pressure fuel pump changed out under warranty, injectors were swapped out. And I know that that car was another well, I know there was a lot more problems imminent with that car. And the problem was every single week I was fixing stuff. It got to the point where I don't care how good it was. And it was pretty good. Don't get me wrong. It was a six-speed manual. I thought, you know what? This is a good keeper. It didn't pay, cost me a lot to buy it because I bought it used. But it was like, no, that thing's a piece of junk. So that car for me crossed that line, crossed that threshold of, yeah, you know what? It's not the car for me. I, I just wasn't interested in constantly fixing stuff. Now the Jaguar, and a lot of you guys are asking, you know, how reliable are they? I'll be honest. A lot of the BMWs that I've been experiencing lately, I mean, a lot of you are aware of, you know, that twin turbo V8 that you'll find in the 50 series cars, you know, called the N63. Um, very, very troublesome engine. I mean, generally pretty robust. However, the problem is you get that hot V and it starts to cook the heads and you get issues with that and you know you're gonna be spending money $15 a liter of oil and you're putting a liter in every you know seven six seven eight hundred miles absolutely out to lunch for me and the fact of the matter is the problems start to to exaggerate on those cars they're difficult to fix in a lot of cases there's lots of problems oil consumption's heavy and quite frankly I don't know if I would go there personally I mean to each his own they're great cars to drive and I've driven all of those cars everything from the modern day BMW lineups and they're all fabulous cars to drive personally if you're gonna have to buy a BMW my personal favorite is the M2 competition is absolutely magnifico that is a great car there will be some issues the carbon fouling the crank hub issues because it's using the s55 engine um, so there will be the odd thing there too so for me that car might be on the positive side of actually keeping you know there will be issues you would expect that but because it's such a fabulous car to drive, I'd probably keep, you know, an M2 competition. I would probably keep an M4 competition. Those cars are fabulous to drive. Porsche 911, you know they're not the cheapest cars on the road, but they're great cars. And, and the F-Type here for me is that balance. 
And a lot of you guys are wondering how reliable is an F-Type? Well, this doesn't, you know, don't think back to the 70s and 80s Jaguars where they used to use the joke that you'd need a ride-along mechanic, otherwise you'd never get anywhere, or you need a second car because the first one's always in the shop so you can toggle back and forth. That's not really that all that true in the modern day Jaguars. It's been through a lot of hands, sure, it's been through Ford, it's been through Tata Motors now. Um, and, and while there are some negatives and drawbacks and you know there are some nickel and dime issues with these cars, a lot of people complain more about the squeaks and rattles. For me, I talk about the pedal bushings, you know, then there's that rusty cross member, um, you know, paint fading on the rear brake calipers. I've had, you know, scratching of the windows and fragile windshield glass. Um, I do know I've got a weird noise coming out of these speakers sometimes. You know, uh, I play my stereo and randomly it sounds kind of hollow. It's almost like I heard there may be a TSP or some kind of bulletin related to that. But the fact of the matter is, um, it's mostly nickel and dime stuff and I think that's what you're gonna find with the F types is nickel and dime some of it can cost a lot of money sure but it's very seldom stuff that's gonna keep the car broken down if if you talk about reliability I mean ultimately reliability is a vehicle in my opinion that's reliable it's gonna start every time it's gonna get you A to B uh, the fact that maybe you don't have a crackly noise in your speaker or you got a squeaky seat that's not a reliability issue that's a low volume quality control issue and quite frankly it's annoying I don't doubt that I don't dispute that one bit however it's not the kind of thing that really is a question of reliability it's more of a question of just low production numbers and the fact that some of the bugs aren't necessarily worked out in these vehicles and so I think that's more of what you're going to expect to find with most of these now a lot of people have talked about other problems with these f-types rear differential um, I recently engaged the dealer and I said, hey, can I get ahead and do my differential fluid change? They told me that the service wasn't due for so many more kilometers. And like, it's almost like they didn't want to take my money. But I would suggest doing your differential fluid changes more frequently. Uh, O2 sensors seems to be a problem. Everywhere you read O2 sensors is a problem that's consistent. Doesn't matter, almost the V6s, the V8s. There's lots of people talking about the O2 sensors. I personally haven't had one yet, knocking on a thick block of wood. But you know what? People talk about that being an issue. And they're not necessarily inexpensive, especially if it's out of warranty. Um, but again, you know, O2 sensors, that's not an uncommon thing that goes on anywhere. Actually, my brother-in-law, he actually has a Toyota Camry and that car has been absolutely bulletproof for him for many years. And now all of a sudden he's had some O2 sensor faults come up. So. It happens. It happens on the best of them and it happens on the worst of them. So, But it is something I would expect. Other things I would expect related to the snorkel and the belt and the pulleys on the supercharger. Um, there's lots of comments about people having issues with squeaks and banging and clunking noises coming from the front end of the supercharger eventually with some miles on them. So I would almost expect or anticipate supercharger pulley related issues. Now that's not the supercharger or the blower itself. As a matter of fact, I haven't heard a lot of issues with the supercharger itself. It's been pretty robust, but it's the front end that actually does uh, separate. You can separate it from the actual supercharger and it's a belt change. And so it's not the end of the world, but it's something to be aware of. That's a common issue as most of the Jags are supercharged. If you buy the V6 or the V8, it will be supercharged. The four cylinder versions now are, um, are turbocharged, so you won't have that issue. But that's something that you would expect to have. I've also heard other issues with uh, coolant leaks. Some people I'm hearing related to, you know, coolant leaks um, coming from the reservoir. I've also, you know, kind of scoured the forums, talked to people. There's been the odd case where they've had to put in one or two different radiators just because they couldn't get rid of a pesky coolant leak. And of course, I would say keep an eye on your fluids. That's always going to be something. It's called maintenance, but in terms of things that break down, like a slight coolant leak is annoying, obnoxious, and it can cost you money eventually, um, but not so much directly related to reliability. Although if you're constantly having major issues with that or you're dumping coolant and it does actually leave your roadside, yeah, that I mean, certainly that is reliability related. The reliability is no longer any worse or better than what you'd get from a BMW of today's standards or a Benz for that matter. I mean, Benz is now, the big thing they're talking about, even the new C-Class Mercedes is related more to electronics. You know, a C300, which is the one that I bought for, the, for my wife, um, when you Google it, there's not a lot of problems people are talking about in terms of mechanical issues or reliability. 
it all seems to be electronic based. And so I think that's what you're going to find with a lot of these vehicles, the Jag, the Benz, the Beamers. Although the Beamers and their constant leaks, you know, after 60, 70, 80,000 miles, you're going to anticipate leaks. Coolant leaks, oil leaks from valve cover gaskets. And then you get the VAG group stuff. So from Audi and Volkswagen, you're going to have oil consumption. That seems to be a problem with that group. I don't know what it is. Actually, an individual, I know a couple people actually recently that had a late model Volkswagen that are finding themselves stuck with a vehicle that are using an excessive amount of oil. So this goes back, harkens back to the early, like say 2012, 2014, you know, A4s, you know, uh, the two liter turbo TFSI engines, totally oil burners. They were an oil burner Royale. And a lot of the VAG engines seem to suffer from that. So obviously gearbox related issues with some of their DCTs were a problem there as well. And see, that's where the F-Type is great. They're using one of the most, most robust transmissions as well. So if you're worried about transmissions, well, it's using the ZF Auto 8-speed transmission. They're absolutely rugged and bulletproof. They shift like a double clutch. They feel as fast as a double clutch transmission, but they don't have the drawbacks. They're a smaller, lighter gearbox, lower maintenance, less problematic. So all the benefits with none of the drawbacks. The ZF Auto in this transmit in these cars is absolutely great. If you can get the auto, if you can get the manual stick with the V6, that's even better. But the ZF Auto does a great job of moving these cars down the road reliably and urgently. It's hard to find when you guys Google and you're looking in the forums and you're quizzing, you know, quizzing people on what the issues and reliability concerns are with these F types. You're gonna find spotty responses and that's primarily because there's not a lot of these cars around the uh, the numbers are relatively low you know I look at the production numbers of the f-type when they first started out production these cars you know there was about a couple thousand produced then back in around 2014 15 16 it peaked at about 4,000 per year produced and then it started scaling down again so less and less of these cars are being purchased and up to about 2020 you're only seeing about maybe 2,000 of these cars sold in a given year. So you're not getting maybe the best representation because a lot of people, A, well, first of all, the numbers aren't there to talk about. And second of all, people aren't putting a ton of miles on a lot of F-types. A lot of people choose not to drive them every day. I do. I personally am going to challenge the norm. I'm going to drive my car every day. As you can see, it's winter time out here. I am literally driving my car every single day. And now that's another topic. We can get into winter driving these another day. I'm, I've got more K's on my car than most people probably do. A lot of people don't bring them out unless the sun's shining and this, the roads are dry. So what that usually means is a lot of these cars only have 10, 20,000 miles on them. Whereas mine already, I'm sitting at 60,000, so probably about 40,000 miles on my car already. And while that's not super high, I, I have no intentions to stop it at any point. I want to keep driving the car. I love driving it. I'm going to test the factors. I'm going to test the reliability. I'm going to test the wear and tear on these cars. And I'm going to show you guys what it's like to own these cars for long term. I'm going to test every norm that we all know with these things. You know, I drive it hard when I can. If I cruise long distance, that's fine too. I test it in all different types of modes and driving styles. So I'm going to use it and I will show you guys what it's all about long term. But the long and short of it is reliability from my experience so far is certainly no worse and I would almost argue that's even better than a lot of the modern day or late model VAG cars as well as the the Benz or the, even the BMW cars for that matter so some issues you would expect but most issues are gonna be nickel and dime again issues scratching glass on the driver door you get debris in there and up and down and you get a little pebble in there and you get scratch glass issues you get issues related to some of the electrics the front windshield, it seems to crack and split very easily. Again, speaker problems, squeaky bushy bushing pedal problems. You might have the odd coolant leak. Um, but honestly, they start great in winter. They're reliable. You know, if there were a few more problems, it probably wouldn't change my, or wouldn't skew my attitude. These cars are absolutely crazy to drive. They look awesome. They sound awesome. And honestly, you know what the deal is? There will never be another car like this. Have you heard the latest on that news? The Jaguar now is, they've, they've pretty much canceled everything aside from the V8 F-Type. So if you want to go into the dealership now and buy one, all you can do is get a V8 powered car. The V6s are gone. The four cylinders are gone. 
And not only that, they're no longer making any substantial changes to the model lineup until 2025. That's right, when Jaguar decides to make some major changes to their lineup, I mean, I wouldn't even be really watching too much in the front page news until 25 now is what they're saying because of this whole new transformation and this transition to electric powered vehicles. Jaguar, I believe, is playing a little safe and they're sort of watching and sampling the market. And honestly, you're not expecting to see any major lineup changes until 2025 at least. And we'll see what it looks like then. There's lots of hearsay about some high horsepower hybrid versions or some kind of electric crossover F-types. But we'll see what that looks like. I, I'm, I'm super stoked to see what Jaguar has in store. The brand is certainly stepping up their, you know, their model lineup. I love a lot of the brands. I like a lot of what the brand's doing today. And honestly, I just can't get enough of driving the F-Type. But with that said, look at this. I just saw a new light on the dash. And what do we have here after a short drive? We have a right, front right low check all tire pressure. So quite clearly, we have a low tire pressure going on there. I don't know what's going on. It could be the cold weather. I don't know, with the snow on the ground, obviously air in the tires must shrink up a little bit and now it loses a little bit of air pressure. So I'll have to check that out and see what the air pressure is saying. So at the end of the day, life really is too short to drive boring cars. Hence, I drive an F-Type. Anything that's great and fun and exciting to drive is always going to be close and near and dear to my heart. Again, like the 335, eventually if something becomes that much of a thorn, then you've got to weigh the balance and reliability is important, but it's not the first priority. Because if you're a car person like I am, you know we're not here forever, so you might as well enjoy the time that we've got. With all of that said, I hope you enjoyed the video and be sure to subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. If you are, thanks to each and every one of you. I love to hear your comments every single week. It's definitely really rewarding to hear from each and every one of you. Hope to see you real soon. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.